Hi, uh, welcome to module two. The first part of module two will be the varied provider networks of uh, healthcare providers who deliver the services to the various managed care organization members. Um, used to use the term doctors, but providers is more reflective of the very many different people who actually provide health care services in any health care delivery service today, not just managed care. The provider network in managed care is a very common element, and it's a network of, of providers that are under very specific contracts. Service plans can also have a network, but they're not considered to be HMOs. There are lots of different HMOs, um, but I'm sorry, managed care organizations, but HMOs, because they try to restrict access and control things, generally have the strongest contracting agreements. And differences tend to be ones of the degree of control rather than any differences based on any particular terms that are going on. Well, why would a managed care organization want a contract? Well, obviously they want to negotiate for the best pricing they can for delivering services to their members. It clearly defines the services that will be delivered by the various health care providers to the members, and it also allows them to clarify the financial conditions that the providers will work under. And these are such things as no balance billing, which means you cannot bill the patient for, the, for, for a balance, meaning you want to charge 60, the managed care organization pays 40, and unlike indemnity plans or other plans, you cannot bill the patient for the 20. That's what you get, $40, that's it. That's regardless, of course, of any co-pays that are part of the member's uh, visit. So if it's a total of $40 that the doctor would get for the visit, and the member is responsible for a $25 copay, then obviously the managed care organization would only be giving the physician $15. The uh, managed care company also wants direct submission of claims uh, because that's certainly much easier for their members than if they have to go fill out forms and mail them in. Not that that's really done anymore, but at one point that was the major way of handling insurance claims. And you also want to make sure that members are held harmless. What does this mean? Again, that if there is a billing dispute or any kind of issues, then the managed care organization um, and the provider work it out. The patient or the member who is responsible for payment is not responsible for any payments um, that are in dispute. So what are the advantage for a, for a provider? Why should they contract? Well, if they're big enough, they then have a much stronger position against the managed care organization and therefore can demand a better payment. And that's why you see physicians and other types of providers, providers coming together and becoming bigger and bigger groups. A good uh, comparison is a union of workers where the workers get together and have much more power against, say, General Motors than if they were trying to negotiate an individual um, contract for each one of them. Uh, it's also to the advantage of a provider to, to be part of the MHO network, I'm sorry, the MCO network, because if the managed care organization is a large player in their area, this ensures them that they can attract patients. Well, direct payment is always better for the physician, too because you just try and get money from a patient when they don't think they have to pay. Collection rates from payment for, for, pay, for patients when they walk out of that office are abysmal. That's probably the main reason why most doctors ask for the copay immediately when you show up. You, the provider will also have an increase in business if he's a preferred provider in the network. More, more patients will want to be with him. And, and last but not least, if there's any um, payment disputes, then the dispute is clearly going to be decided by um, whatever the contract is. Service areas. It's an interesting concept, and it's a very important thing. 
because this is controlled by the state also. A managed care organization service area is what area specifically they are allowed to sell their products and deliver services in. Uh, for example, GHI is primarily a New York City operation and the suburbs because that is where most of the employees who are primarily New York City uh, employees live. Indemnity plans, which is an old-fashioned standard insurance plan, it really doesn't matter because wherever you are, you're going to get paid the same 80, 20, whatever it is, completely different. And the HMOs are very different because of this. The service area of an HMO depends on the geography of its provider network. And what does that mean? It means if the HMO doesn't have enough docs and other providers in the area, it really can't sell because access standards are, are important and they're usually determined by drive time or travel time in urban areas and the access standards are different. Uh, they are different for a rural area or an urban area and also by the type of provider that you are going to. This is just an example in, of a Texas situation, and you can see, and it's really not important, but you can see the, the different managed care organizations, and you can see the geography of where they work. So these are their service areas. Each um, different product has a different service area. And what you should notice is they do try to make them contiguous, meaning that they're all attached to each other. And the urban areas, again, the times and distances that are required, the minimum distances that are required at times to get to a dock are smaller. Rural areas have to allow for longer travel times to a hospital, to, a, to the uh, primary care people in the area, and the specialists. Also, the numbers of primary care doctors or specialists in an area are going to be based on population density. Uh, what do I mean? You're not going to have a city like Dallas with, you know, uh, two primary care people, doctors for, 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 say, half a city, which would be one to, you know, one doctor to, um, you know, 50,000 patients. Or, you know, if you look at it this way, you know, one doctor per square mile is not going to cut it in Dallas. But out in the rural areas, one doc for 50 square miles might be enough because of the various popular de population densities. And these things are open to negotiation, both with the providers and the state regulators. Service areas. Uh, PPOs may or may not have similar requirements. These are per preferred provider organizations. And the blues have additional meanings for the terms. And um, they have... Um, geographic boundaries where they will use both signs to delineate their areas. So what other specifications uh, have to be made? Well, if you're going to have a service area, you have to have primary care docs who are willing to take on new patients. If you don't, the state may forbid them from selling in that area. California, which is often ahead of the curve or behind the curve, depending on what you think of what they do, they're deciding about adding other things in other than travel time or distance. And that would be, how long do I have to wait to get an appointment with my doc? And they're mandating 10 days for a primary care, 15 days for a specialist. And we don't know if this really can be done. It's very hard to measure these things. And a lot of factors could be out of the control of the HMO or the providers. What if they're having a, what's going on now, a measles epidemic? Um, could be hard to get a primary care appointment with a pediatrician for standard care or something. Or if, or if there's a massive influenza outbreak, that can also, at least for a temporary period of time, affect your access to your primary care doctor. And I'm not sure a managed care plan or a primary care doc in the plan should be penalized for that type of a situation. Well, there are physicians and other professionals that are involved in delivering health care. Uh, one of the things that you need to know about, um, just uh, for your information and because things are changing, 
is all healthcare providers now have a national provider number. This was developed under the HIPAA law. It's similar to a social security card that we all have, that which, which is, whether we like it or not, in many ways, our national identification number. And basically what it does, uh, does it provides a unique national identification number for every healthcare provider to use. And they basically use this in all their financial transactions with any kind of um, insurance company. And hospitals, doctors, any kind of a provider will have um, a, a card like that. And this picture is just a mock-up of a typical claim with the NPI number on there. So you see it does have to be on every single uh, form. Contract management. This is a major, major issue for managed care organizations. They can literally have thousands of contracts with individual providers. And if the organization has more than one type of service, um, an organization could be a staff model HMO, have a point of service, or a preferred provider organization set up. It can have all three. So you might have a different contract format for each type. Um, the contracts, uh, and we're not going to get into it too much here because they are major legal types of issues. Um, you can have a master contract and then a section for each type of service provided. And the contract is important because it sets the standards for all the business functions and requirements of both the payer and the provider of the service. It really says everything they have to do and everything how they're going to get paid. And I don't think you could have done this 50 years ago. The contract management is so complex, it has to be automated. There are systems called contract management systems, and they are used all the time. They're usually part of a payer's IT system. It, they're getting so complex now, and with many new laws, such as uh, requirements under the Affordable Care Act, that this task is often being outsourced to true experts who do nothing else, who can do it uh, essentially cheaper and probably better than the managed care organization can do it by themselves. Well, the professional network are those people that provide the different services to the members of the managed care organization. And it's more than just docs. Uh, it's physicians, uh, mental health people like psychologists, optometrists. You can have clinical nurse practitioners. Um, I don't think they really practice. In, I know they don't practice independently in New York and New Jersey. They have to um, practice directly under the care of a, super, of, of a uh, supervising physician, but they're out there. And it does not include those people working for a facility or in an office. It's really the people who are in charge. And the systems that they use for non-physicians are pretty similar to uh, what they do for physicians. Because remember, these people are delivering um, health care services. And the primary focus, at least we'll talk about now, are physicians. And of course, there are primary care physicians, which you all are familiar with, specialists, which I think most people know, cardiologists, orthopedists, surgeons, neurologists, etc. And there's also hospital-based physicians. And these can be people who deliver services uh, to patients who are admitted to the hospital, or be those physicians who, due to the nature of their specialty, only work within a hospital. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. And there can be some differences between an HMO and a PPO. And general and staff models are different, but for the purpose of this talk, it's it's not um, particularly important. So what's going on? Well, whether we like it or not, managed care and in all its variations is becoming the majority of the way care is being delivered in the United States. And as a result, the vast majority of virtually every area of medical care delivered by physicians is now under contract. Um, and if you look here, you could see that it's 
if you look at the prime, you know, if you look at the primary care specialties, internists, family practitioners, pediatricians, and OBGYNs, they're all very close to 90%. Medical subspecialties slightly less, and surgeons know they're not going to get paid without insurance, so they're pretty much on board too. So according to the AMA, we have a lot of docs in this country. And one of the problems is we probably don't have enough um, primary care physicians. But primary care physicians can come from three areas. They can specialize in family practice, internal medicine, or pediatrics. In fact, many of our doctors, when you go to your own doctor and you see he's you know, board certified internal medicine or he says internal medicine, most of these guys may have, or, and gals, may have a specialty, but in the real world, they're also doing primary care because they need to cover their bills. And in certain areas, and I, GPs, I think, have basically gone away. They're mostly historical. Uh, in certain very rural areas, you still might find one or two of them around, but I would be really surprised if you did. One of the important things that the Affordable Care Act allowed, and there really was a trend to this even before, was to allow direct access to primary cares, which was never an issue in OBGYNs. There was a big uproar with managed care initially, where they were sort of restricting access to OBGYNs by women. And the reality of the world is that for many women, their OBGYN is their primary care doc. So as a result, both of regulatory pressures and competitive pressures and probably um, public uh, views of what they do or publicity, uh, all the managed care um, companies now basically allow access to OBGYNs as primary care. And as I said before, um, many specialty trained internal medicine physicians are doing primary care work. However, for some patients who are in their office, they may be their primary care physician, but by referral, they may get referrals from other primary care physicians to practice their specialty. And other uh, practices and other types of specialty like cardiology, kidney, nephrology, immunology, allergy, they're pretty much specialty care only and they're not doing much in the, in the way of um, primary care. Uh, one interesting group of specialty physicians are the hospital-based physicians. And these are people who, it's just the very nature of their practice that they have to work within a hospital. Um, radiologists are mostly doing um, x-rays, but they also do lots of other procedures now um, that are actually delivering care. And then anesthesiology, everybody knows what that is. Pathology, these are the guys who diagnose disease. Emergency medicine, of course, is self-explanatory. And the hospitalist is a relatively new breed. This is a doctor who really only works in the hospital with hospitalized patients. And many doctors will, I guess the best word is um, outsource their hospital care to these people who are real specialists in taking care of acute care situations. And they can do this both for private practitioners and they can actually even be employed by a managed care organization or an HMO to literally just take care of the organization's patients that are within a hospital. It is a growing area of specialty. Um, one of the reasons they have a lot of power, these hospital-based physicians, it's kind of hard to need the type of care that a hospital delivers and not need a radiologist, a pathologist, um, or even an, an anesthesiologist. Uh, these docs often have very strong power because the hospitals can't run without them. And the managed care organization wants them to be under contract because their services can be very, very costly. 
and these costs will come right out of the managed care organization's budget and not the patients um, if they have to pay for them separately. Um, one of the big problems that used to go on and initially gave managed care some of a bad name was um, emergency room coverage. And everybody has heard the st story that you go to the emergency room and um, you get a bill for $5,000 and you go home that day or whatever. And then the health insurance company says, well, you shouldn't have been in the emergency room. And then you get into the whole thing. Well, how am I supposed to know that? I'm not a doctor. I hurt, et cetera, et cetera. Um, makes the papers. There's fights. There's collections. So uh, they went to this prudent layperson definition, which essentially means that if any reasonable person would feel they needed to go to the hospital, then it's acceptable. And therefore, the managed care company will pay. There still is a perverse incentive to be careful to using these places. Many um, health insurance plans will charge you, say, $300 for an emergency room visit, and then only $25, for example, if you're admitted. Um, so it's kind of interesting um, how that's working out. Um, most people, when they go to the emergency room, aren't worried about money. They, they're scared and they're frightened and they need to be there. Um, they are trying the managed care organizations to get emergency room doctors to accept assignment, meaning to participate in contracts. And I believe most of them are doing it. And you actually have a lot of emergency care services now that are outsourced where an outside medical group provides emergency services to hospitals and those out uh, those uh, medical emergency room groups for want of a better word will end up negotiating with the managed care organizations well the hospitalist hospitalist is the fourth type of um, h PB, hospital-based physician. We spoke to them a, a little bit. Um, they're really um, pretty good. Most of them have fairly good abilities to treat patients. Um, there's a subset of them that will only work, say, in the intensive care unit. Um, well, I, thank goodness, personally have never seen one. Uh, I have seen them operate and, and, and take care of family members, and I frankly have been very impressed with them. You know, they've seen it all before, they've done it, they have clear plans of action and algorithms how to treat people, and they really provide very good care. I think this is an extremely good development for patient care. And they're growing, as you can see. Uh, and most of them are employed by hospitals, as they should be. Um, and uh, these academic medical center programs, not only do they employ them, but that's where they are actually trained to do what they do. Um, they can be in medical groups as a specialist. If your medical group is big enough, you can have one person in charge of all the people in the hospital. Um, there probably, in some large groups, are certain areas where this works. Um, a multi-state hospitalist is interesting. Uh, I would think there are licensing issues. You probably have a large medical group that may work across, say, New York, New Jersey, or New York, Connecticut, and they might have one in each state, or they may have folks with dual licenses. Um, and I don't know if I necessarily agree with this statement that the short term is good. Uh, but negative in the medium and long term because you, I have to wonder, you know, are you talking about people who are very sick who no matter what happens are not going to have good outcomes just because they're so ill? Um, I, I would need to personally look at that data more before I would go along with this statement as strongly as uh, it's written here. Well, what is the value of a mid-level practitioner? Um, not to be a cynic, they work for less money than a physician. Um, sometimes they perhaps might give better care because they, they, they can focus on more routine things that 
that is of interest to them uh, that may not be of interest or as much of a focus to a busy physician. Um, most of them will work for a, for a physician or medical group under supervision. There are some states that will allow them allow uh, certified nurse practitioners or clinical nurse practitioners to practice independently. I don't know if that's the case in New York. Um, my bias is, uh, frankly, that I would prefer to go to a physician, and if I'm going to be seen by a clinical nurse specialist, that's fine. But uh, you know, my own bias is I want that person to be under the um, supervision of a physician because I, I know some very uh, high-powered academic physicians and you know they of course have their own conflict of interest but what they said to me once was very interesting certain er people don't know what they don't know and that can be very dangerous um, and while these people are well trained they have not gone through the same rigors of medical school and residency that physicians have so I, I think they are an important extender of medical care for physicians and very useful uh, but my own bias and it's really only my own opinion is they should be under the supervision of a medical doctor um, many of them work under supervision as you could see here um, if you if you add up the numbers 80 uh, 38 35 is 73 82 82% are probably under supervision of somebody else. That 8% in a rural setting probably have close contact with a physician. And I really am not sure what other settings might be. There might be Indian reservations, clinics. I'm, I'm not very sure. All right. There's lots of different types of contracting situations for individual physicians and medical groups. And often individual physicians uh, will need to contract with an HMO or any insurance company. And that can be a relatively weak position because they're by themselves. Medical groups are much more powerful because they can deliver lots of services. Uh, they can be giving lots of care within a service area and if you don't have them on board you won't have access and the best medical groups are all or none meaning they're all in or none are in with the groups and the larger groups can be more complex they can be groups combining primary care and specialty care or it can be one large specialty group like you can have a very busy orthopedic practice with six or seven surgeons that in certain areas could have 60 70 percent of the business and if you don't have a contract with them you're not going to be able to provide services to your payers uh, to, not your payers to your members who are paying you um, big groups are complex as we mentioned in the other slide they have more negotiating leverage they're going to have more capabilities um, the way they're paid really is not relevant unless the HMO is paying them directly. But more importantly, groups can probably manage capitation better than everybody else. And we haven't cap talked much about capitation yet. Trust me, we will. But basically, that's where you get a set fee for each patient in the, in the organization every month, whether you see them or not. Uh, an IPA... An independent practice association is probably the most common form of HMOs today. The IPA really works with the physicians. It's almost a middleman and then contracts with the health plan. And the IPA gets paid by the health plan and really how they pay the physicians is up to them. So the IPA is a very effective middleman. It, it really... Um, is the primary, it's almost like the union boss. He brings all of the uh, players to the table and he's the one who can work with both the plan and the providers to work out a reasonable contract that is both economical for the plan, pays the physicians fairly, and provides the required services for the plan members. 
they can work in many different ways and just a few of them are, li are, are shown here. It can be all of them. It could be only the primary docs. It could be a specialty. It could be in a certain area or it might be just part of a hospital or, or as it's called an integrated uh, delivery system. So it can be a lot of different ways. They all have to meet the credentialing requirements of the plan, meaning they all have to show the certifications and documentation that they meet uh, the licensing requirements and, and any additional requirements the HMO may have. Um, the IPA may, ca may carry out other things such as uh, contract management and quality ma management. And like I said, they may function like a union. The plan's ability to pick and choose what individuals that are taking care of their patients is eliminated is I'm sorry is limited and capita capitation or managing risk may or may not work so well with this group and you really have to have a almost literally an emergency reserve if this works or not so the integrated delivery systems are really uh, can have lots of different parts. Um, you can have it with a physician hospital organization, a management services organization, a hospital with physicians who are employed fully in the hospital, or it could be a mixture of all of them. So it really is going to depend on a situation by situation by situation occurrence and exactly what happens is going to depend on how everything is actually structured. So what are the advantages? Well, if you've got a lot of doctors and delivery s services, you, you have a lot of power. Um, think about some of the recent ads you've seen um, uh, where on the news when, when some of the managed care organizations got into fights with uh, some of the big New York hospitals and you see an ad on where, or see something paper, you will not be able to come to our hospital because United Healthcare is cheap or whatever. But this gets out and it's really not good for the uh, insurance company. Um, the health plan will have um, less influence over how services are delivered. And they may fight or differ, to put it nicely, on who can provide what services and what they're going to do for utilization review and quality manage. Because these are not as tight as some of the HMO models, if there is capitated risk, there usually has to be a life preserver or a bailout. But if you're big enough, you have market power and you can affect the negotiation. Um, there are different types of negotiations. A faculty practice plan is very simply uh, doctors who work for a hospital will often have a private practice office in the hospital. Uh, if you go to a big place like New York University, they have this big building called the faculty practice building where the docs actually see their own private patients there, even though they're fully employed by the hospital. Uh, you can have a specialty management company uh, where they only work with one type of physician. They're pretty tight. They understand what's going on in these particular situations because they understand the diseases and they're very focused on, on certain diseases and pretty much know what there is to know about them at that point are pretty good for risk sharing or capitation. A rental network is very interesting. Basically, um, you're renting a whole bunch of doctors to provide care for the managed care organization. And this allows you to expand in those areas where you may not have a staff. Um, these are just interesting ways of doing certain things, these rental networks. Um, I am not personally familiar with them. Uh, they do allow certain uh, access to um, fee structures. It may lower costs, but you have to be very clear for members what these uh, situations are. 
uh, a new thing popping up are these retail clinics. You see them a lot in CVS. What do they call them? Minute clinics or something. Uh, they can provide uh, routine care. Uh, they are very unpopular with primary care physicians who don't want to see their patients going for simple stuff. They make a lot of money on to these uh, clinics. Uh, I, in fact, do see the popularity of that. Um, if I go to the CVS for a flu shot, it costs me nothing with my prescription card. If I was to go to the doctor, I have to pay an office visit, make an appointment. Um, so I can see why um, this has them concerned. In fact, my own primary care doctor has basically stopped doing any vaccinations of adults and everything because they're very costly to hold on to these vaccines and uh, it doesn't do it enough now with the competition. So why do you have all these different forms? Well, you have to, you have, to have access. And access takes into account the marketing plans. And you, along with marketing plans for them to work, you have to be able to provide the appropriate levels of service. It is crucial to have enough primary care docs. And if you have, to, and the length of time that you have to wait for a primary care or specialty appointment to get care it can be a disaster. If you have to wait a long time, you're not going to get patients. Access and ease of access is particularly important to an HMO where the members are tight and must use the contracted providers within the network. And what can change the needs for access? Well, if I'm competing against a larger plan, if I now have a new service area, if I'm adding a new product such as a Medicaid managed care plan, then I need to make sure I have enough access for not only my new members, but my current members too. Well, physician credentialing is a very important thing. It basically means you are what you say you are. And it's done through several agencies, including the National Practitioner Data Bank and the Health Integrity Protection Data Bank. Credentials have to be uh, either verified by a managed care or an accredited uh, CVO. A CVO is another one of those wonderful acronyms we're going to deal with, and it's just a certified uh, credentialing organization, credentialing veri verification organization. And they'll often make on-site visits um, to check out the place, and you do have to be re-credentialed every three years or so, depending on what the contract says. And like I said, they um, need to say who they say they are. You do often need to have credentialing for other types of providers, but that may be done by a national organization rather than uh, a specific credentialing uh, process. And the Health Integrity and Protection Data Bank is basically a listing of those docs who have committed fraud. And all these things are reviewed at the on-site visit to both the physician or the provider facility. So what does physician network maintenance mean? It means, well, keeping everybody in the network on target with what they must do to be a member in good standing and deliver services to the managed care organization. If there's a lot of complaints, um, the physician can be booted. Um, most plans have provider relation reps who work with physicians to fix them. And they also have a system that includes these on-site visits, particularly if they, if they run into issues or complaints. Because the last thing you want to do is have complaints from your members about the care that's being delivered. Um, they do monitor them, as I said, closely for complaints. Um, and while it can be done, the publicity of removing a patient from a network is ugly. And the medical community is very small, and they all hear about it. And you can end up with lawsuits if you get somebody out because you're saying you're you know, slandering your, their character, whatever. So this can be a challenge that has to be very, very carefully done.
Well, there's also hospitals and facilities that are paying uh, or being paid by managed care groups to provide service. Uh, unfortunately, with the nature of, of hospitals, you can forget about community-based hospitals. Small 150, 200, maybe even 250 beds, they're going away. Or they're being bought up by other hospitals, like uh, Cornell has bought Lawrence Hospital in Bronxville. Montefiore has bought several hospitals in Westchester, including, um, I believe it was called a hospital for New Rochelle, and they've just bought Nyack Hospital in Rockland. Multi-hospital systems are really the way they're going now. And they're usually tied to a big fancy hospital, like you'll hear hospitals in this area talk Oh, we're part of Cornell, we're part of Columbia, we're part of Montefiore. And they're becoming more common than single hospitals ever were. Um, part of this is due to the simple fact that they need more power against all the insurance companies. And they can be a regional power like Montefiore is the boss in the Bronx uh, Manhattan it's Cornell and Columbia and maybe NYU out in Long Island Long Island Jewish uh, North Shore um, Westchester not so much I think um, I don't think Westchester County Medical Center has all that kind of a power but the biggest problem if you think about Obamacare there was a big stink that hey we're going to have this health insurance, but we can't get into the really good hospitals with this insurance. So who wants it? So that really, I think, focuses just how important this must-have issue can be for hospital care. There are other contracting situations for for-profit hospitals or regional chains. Think of the Cancer Treatment Centers of America, big for-profit chain that has a high profile. Uh, specialized hospitals, as they're listed below. And um, single-owned physician specialty hospitals, these kind of, I think, are going away. There are a few left. Um, I don't know of any offhand in the New York area, but I bet there are some in, a, in some local or, or smaller market. Um, hospitals can get rated as Tier 1 or 2. You can be a center of excellence meaning like this is the place to go for, say, an organ transplant, this is the place to go for a hip, whatever. Um, and the preferred hospitals will have smaller co-payments than the tier two hospitals for members. Uh, that's to incentivize them to obviously use those um, hospitals that have the um, better, how should I put it, the better contracts for the managed care organization. Big hospitals can resist this, and I don't really see much of this in New York where you have some very powerful hospital systems. There are other situations, um, subacute care, where um, you're in that funny spot between, well, I don't really need a hospital anymore, but I can't go home, hospice for end-of-life care, uh, ambulatory procedure places where you go in in the morning and go out at night. Um, they can be independent or physician owned. We talked a little bit about retail health clinics and urgent care centers, which is that midpoint between an emergency room uh, and, you know, I can't get to my doctor, but like I have a really bad cut or something or a terrible cold, let me go there. Um, many managed care organizations will gladly pay for this to keep you out of a very expensive emergency room. There's a whole host of other types of delivery systems and they are listed here. Uh, other services that people need that are often under contract are laboratory tests, various imaging, which are usually all done in one place these days, uh, simple cardiac tests, and of course simple other diagnostic testing which can be blood tests or whatever. Um, other areas of ancillary services that will be on the contract are rehab centers, physical therapy, speech therapy, um, ambulance and transportation can be done um, 
as separate contracts um, or part of your plan. It really depends on the individual plan. Uh, these people generally do not have credentialing as long as these centers are licensed by the state and have been accredited by the various agencies uh, that are responsible for crediting them. Either the Joint Commission is one of them. There are also some very specific agencies for long-term care um, and for uh, these uh, other services. And they usually have it posted and they are subjected to routine inspection on a regular and timely basis. Um, here's a whole bunch more listings of them. Um, you can go down and pretty much figure out which are for what. And um, they are watched and it's important for these agencies or these delivery services to be accredited by these agencies or they may not qualify for membership and to provide service. Uh, the accountable care organizations and the patient-centered medical homes, um, these are two new abbreviations I've got to learn. Uh, it's a pilot. Um, we're going to have to see how this works. Um, again, I just think it's too soon to know if these things are really going to be viable. Um, the PCHM is uh, physician-based, uh, and we're not sure if the ACO will bring in enough to make it worthwhile, but Medicare is looking at it because they really need to save money. And perhaps if it starts getting people to get too much care, it may just accidentally drive prices up. So the end result of all of this is managed care and paying uh, and the provider network rather and how they're paid is a work in progress and continuing to evolve. And whatever we're doing now is surely going to be different soon.